Okay, so this is the second part of the review that we did in class for your test on genetic engineering as well as genetic control or regulation. So the first question here, how do we open the plasmid? Well, obviously, we've gone over this a few times. You open a plasmid using a restriction enzyme. Another question that's related to this, if we skip down to question three, we seal it up with ligase. You've got to know these vocabulary words. All right, number two is a little bit vague. So in class, I gave you guys a little more idea of what I was looking for here. So number one, remember that restriction enzymes can either make blunt ends or they can make sticky ends. So in this particular case, you would want a restriction enzyme that makes sticky ends because if it makes blunt ends, then you're not gonna be able to stick the gene into the plasmid. You can still use restriction enzymes with blood ends. For example, if all you wanna do is run an electrophoresis and break DNA into pieces, you don't need sticky ends. Um, the other thing that you would want in a plasmid is you would want, uh, not a plasmid, I'm sorry, in a restriction enzyme, you would wanna cut the DNA twice. In other words, this is a, a big, long piece of DNA. What we would want to do is find a restriction enzyme that would cut it on either side of the gene that we want to insert. Because as it is right now, first of all, it's really big, and secondly, it doesn't have sticky ends. You need a sticky end on each side of it. The other thing you would need it to do is to cut the plasmid, and you would really only want to cut the plasmid once, because all you really want to do is open it. So your goal here would be to get something that looks kind of like this, something that opens the plasmid. You would insert this DNA, and when you add ligase, hopefully you would end up with the plasmid with the DNA in it um, that you were interested in. It's true that it's possible that this plasmid could just close back up again, etc. That's the whole purpose of screening, is to see which plasmids actually ended up as uh, recombinant DNA. All right, uh, and then number four, what if the site, the cut site, is in the middle of the TET gene, meaning the gene right here? Would this plasmid still be useful? Yes, it would still be useful because you could still use ampicillin resistance gene to screen it. If the tetracycline resistance was the only gene there for screening, then no, it would not, it wouldn't work because there would be no way to screen it. So you'd end up with some bacteria growing that picked up the plasmid and some that had not, and you would have no way of knowing which is which. You want a pure culture. So as long as, even if it cuts in the middle of the tetracycline resistance gene, as long as there's some other way to screen it, you're okay. All right, next. Uh, this is simple. I could definitely ask you to do this on the short answer part. Imagine that this is, uh, these are three pieces of DNA and they were cut with restriction enzymes. So let's say we take this piece of DNA and we chop it up, the blue lines are the places where it got cut, and then we uh, place it in a well at the negative terminal and we run an electrophoresis. And the question was um, for you to, or the, the request was for you to map this and show where each of these would be. So I'm gonna number these, one, two, three, and four to estimate where they would go. The make it, biggest mistakes people make is they put the really light ones at the top. In other words, they start counting here with like something that's one base pair long and down here have the one that's 100 base pairs long. That is incorrect because this is an electrophoresis. The lighter pieces travel farther. So we would expect for piece number one to be way down here. And piece number four so this would be number one. Number four should be even further along because it's even smaller. Piece number two is probably going to be, and again, this is sort of open to your judgment, but maybe back here would be piece number two. And three is a little smaller than that, so maybe you would put three here. The only thing that I would be looking for is that the shortest piece you put the furthest down and the longest or biggest piece you put the furthest back. So that's how you would do a problem like that. This is actually um, a plasmid, and it's about plasmid mapping if it was a linear plasmid. So I'm gonna do a, a quick walkthrough of this. This is sort of trial and error. They're showing you no restriction enzyme here. So that tells us that the length of our plasmid is 1,650 base pairs long. So if I draw this out and I pretend like this is my DNA, 
The whole DNA is 1,650 base pairs long. If I pick either one of these enzymes, I can see that SAL1 cut this DNA one time. Because it's a linear DNA, one cut would give me two pieces. One piece is 1,200 base pairs long, and the other one is 450. So based on that, I'm going to put the cut for this over here. And I'm going to mark this as SA1. And I'm going to mark that this piece is 1,200 base pairs long, and this piece is 450 base pairs long. Now, I also know it cut, the second enzyme cut it twice and gave me three bands. Um, and I know that when I put both of the enzymes together, this 450 band was left alone. So that tells me, since that band is still there, that the cuts that the other one makes must not interfere with this segment right here. The cuts must be further down. So I notice that I have a piece that's 400 and a piece that's 200, and then I have a piece that's 1,050. I also notice that the 400 and the 200 are also not made any smaller when um, both enzymes cut. So it's a sort of trial and error, but I would suggest just giving it a shot. I know I'm going to put this one to be 400 and this is KPA1 and let's say I make this one the 200 and this is my other cut for KPA1. Actually, I don't believe it matters. You could flip-flop these. Now, if you want to double check this to make sure that it works, we know that we'd have a 400, a 200, and that basically split this 1200 up. We have a 400, a 200, a 450, and the other one that's there um, is a 600. Okay, we can double check that everything adds up and I'm actually gonna show you the one that was provided because it's a little bit neater than the mess that I made. So here's theirs. Notice theirs is sort of flip-flop from mine, but it doesn't matter as long as the numbers add up properly. So the whole thing was 1650 long. If we look at the cut for SAL1, we see that it would cut here and give us a 450 and a, what, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, a 1200. On the flip side, if we then turn around and cut it with just the other one, we would get a 400, a 200, and a 1050 from here to here. And then when we cut it with both, we get the 450, the 600, the 200, and the 400. If you do it incorrectly, you'll see that the numbers won't add up. You'll end up cutting it, and then when you go back and look at the electrophoresis, um, the bands will not match the cuts that you placed. Okay, uh, this is, we'll just do this one really quickly. This is a linear DNA, which piece was probably not cut at all. That would be PC. PC is all the way back here at 1,000. Um, and there's only one band. If it was cut, you should have at least seen two bands. How many cuts were made in DNA strand B? DNA strand B, right here, we have one, two, three, four pieces. We're still assuming this is linear. So if it's linear and we get four pieces, one, two, three, three cuts would give us four pieces. Whoops, three, four. If A and B were parents, could any of the others be their child? We're trying to keep this really simple, so I know some of these probably do not uh, actually match up perfectly, but I can tell you what I was intending to go for here was the fact that the only one that could be their child would be E. The rule would be that the child had to get every band they have had to come from either one parent or the other. So if we look at um, C, C has a band right here and neither of these two parents have it, and D has a band here and neither of the parents have it. But E, parent has this one, parent has this one, parent has this one, and a parent has this one, so this one could be their child. Again, I, I realize the bands don't um, add up perfectly. Okay, this one, they wanted a, a possible diagram showing cuts, possible places for cuts in A. So the whole thing was 1,000 base pairs long, and we had bands at 600, 390, and 10. So you'd get 600, 390, 10. There would be absolutely nothing wrong with doing 600, 10, 390, that would be fine too. Or any combination, because with the information you have, that you know it doesn't really give you any idea of the order. If it was circular, a diagram of lane A, we would do this, 
So we'd say, okay, it's a thousand base pairs long. We make our first cut at 12 o'clock. We'll just call this enzyme A that's cutting it there. Since our first cut is about 600 long and we're assuming this adds up to a thousand, I would put it here and show the enzyme A cut it there too. And then we have a 390 and a 10. So I'm gonna put it here and that would make this 10 and this 390. But again, this line up here could just as easily go right there. 